MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology, replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Welcome back to the show, Chris. Thank you so much. Kinder Morgan, the Canadian government purchased the pipeline in order to, I guess, further the construction and twinning of it. Is this going to be a good deal for the Canadian taxpayer, considering they haven't been able to find a buyer? We're extremely worried about this. Uh, this is something that a private company was uh, much more than willing to foot the bill for. They were going to pay the whole freight. Uh, Kinder Morgan uh, wanted to expand and twin their existing pipeline, which has operated since the 1950s, running from Edmonton out to Burnaby all this time. And because of the actions mostly of the B.C. government and foot-dragging by the federal government, uh, they've now bailed on it. And so now, unfortunately, Canadian taxpayers are left holding the deed to the pipeline that they didn't want to buy. And so that's where it's extremely frustrating. We had a private company willing to spend their own money and hire thousands of people and provide jobs and provide a resource export, and now we're stuck with it. And so, frankly, we're not surprised that they weren't able to find uh, a quick, you know, third-party buyer in such a short time frame. And frankly, given the climate, uh, the business climate, and how uh, the province of B.C. is behaving, and how lackluster and lukewarm uh, the federal government has been in enforcing the law, what country, what, what company in its right mind would actually invest in this thing and say, sure, I'll buy that, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up legal fights for the next several years, we'll try to build this thing. So I'm not surprised, unfortunately, but we are disappointed. And so now the best we can hope for is somehow the federal government becomes really good and really efficient at twinning a massive pipeline and is able to sell it once it's finished as quickly as possible. Well, I think Kinder Morgan expected to make a, a $40 billion profit on the pipeline uh, through its lifetime. Would that be good for Canadian taxpayers to have that kind of income? It would if the government is capable of twinning it and running it. And that's a huge if, because as we know, we only need to look at something as simple as a payroll system that is operated uh, out of the capital, and that doesn't even function properly. And all that is is a software program that literally pays federal employees. It's a software program called Phoenix. And they've bungled that so badly that they're burning billions of dollars trying to fix it. It's so much so that the Auditor General, the Federal Auditor General, had to wade into it and actually do a report on it. So if they can't manage a paper payroll system for bureaucrats and how they get paid, we aren't very hopeful, frankly, that they'd be able to actually manage and run a pipeline system and actually make money doing it. We're, we're quite concerned. Uh, I'm being sarcastic here, but... You know, we always have leaks on what the government is planning to do. Would we expect leaks from a government-made pipeline? That's a great question. You know, <laughs> it's one of those things where you just shudder to think about it because then they start, what, handing out contracts to friends, handing out contracts to uh, niche groups or to select groups that may not be the best people for the job. Um, or do they start bending their own rules? There are all sorts of questions and concerns that crop up with something like this. And that's where you just, it's so frustrating where you can take a company that is otherwise used to doing things like twinning pipelines, running them and making a profit, like, you know, an energy company like Trans Mountain, and then throwing that into the lap of the federal government, which is at the best of times like a big gangly mess. It covers everything from fisheries to national defense and wastes a lot of money while doing so and, you know, loses files while doing so. The idea of them running a pipeline it just makes you shudder. And so we're hoping that it doesn't include things like leaks. Let's hope not. But we are bracing ourselves for a heck of a lot of waste of taxpayers' money. And keep in mind what that money could have been spent on. You know, once you tack on what it would cost, bare minimum, 
just to twin that thing. Um, once you tack that on, you could have provided clean drinking water systems and uh, sewage systems for every First Nation across Canada about four times over for that cost. You could have built world-class rec centers, including full theaters and Olympic-sized swimming pools and indoor running tracks and libraries all in one complex. You'd build more than 60 of them across Canada just for what they finished signing on for. So it's it's a troubling time right now for, for Canadian taxpayers. Could you see this eventually be contracted out to somebody like Kinder Morgan themselves so they would make even more money? You know, that might wind up happening because it's not like the government has an off-the-shelf company sitting there waiting to just take the cellophane off of it and then they'll know how to twin and run a pipeline. They will eventually have to figure that out. They will have to contract it out to a third party, maybe even to Kinder Morgan itself or they'll have to somehow bring in uh, foremen and project managers and job site managers who know these workers and can actually muster them, organize them, and get them to build it. The idea, like, this is such a huge project. The idea of the government getting it done is, is leery, and so they're going to have to do a lot of contracting out, whether that's with one company by throwing it back at Kinder Morgan and a contract basis, or a, a motley crew of companies, which, of course, would increase cost and cause delays. Yeah, who knows what they're going to wind up doing, but we're we're very, very concerned about it. And again, it just didn't have to happen. All that the feds had needed to do was to get off their backsides and actually enforce the law. They had already declared that it had the green light, it had been given all of the proper uh, regulatory approvals. All they needed to do was declare that the feds have the right of way, which they do, and to just say this is what's going to happen. But Prime Minister Trudeau didn't do that, and so here we are. Yes, and they probably could have passed a law saying you can't challenge this in the courts because it's federal jurisdiction. Yeah, it, all it is is paramountcy. They just needed, they didn't even need to pass a law. Apparently we were speaking with a, with a specialist in this area. It would have taken them a morning's worth of work <laughs> within cabinet. They wouldn't have even needed to pass a bill in the House of Commons. All they need to say is, it's a term, I think it's called paramountcy. They just needed to say, yeah, the law of the land is the law of the land. And one of those laws of the land is that the federal government has jurisdiction over transportation and transit of these ish- of uh, cross uh, provincial boundaries. And that includes pipelines. It's very clear. It's very, very clearly written. So that's all they needed to do, but they didn't do it. Uh, I think it's called, uh, in legal terms, ultra vires. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it basically goes down to the right of the crown. Yes, exactly. And so it's very clearly spelled out that it's the right of the crown, it's the right of the feds to deal with things like pipelines that cross interprovincial boundaries. And so the BC government can, you know, put up whatever fight they want, but at the end of the day, if something has been federal, if a pipeline especially has been federally approved, federally regulated, given the green light, there's really not much for the BC government to do in that case as far as challenging the federal government goes. And that's where we were really disappointed with the federal government because they didn't need to do much. (laughs) They only needed to enforce what they had already said they were going to do, but they didn't. They ragged the puck and dragged their feet, and we wound up with a massive corporation like Trans Mountain throwing its hands up in the air and saying, you know what, we're not doing this anymore. And not only does that put this current project in jeopardy and in peril and in question, it sends a signal to other corporations and other companies that Canada can't get its act together, that even if you come in into Canada and you spend millions of dollars and many, many years going through dozens and dozens of hearings and consultations, you name it, blah, 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 you get all the green lights, you still won't be guaranteed the right to expand your own infrastructure, and that is the, Mount, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And so it's a terrible signal to send uh, to the rest of the world. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after the break. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABNAF. 
surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines. Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, you have some concerns about ICBC rates for motorhomes. Can you explain? Yes, and so it's that time of year, especially here in British Columbia, where you'll see people getting out and about, and they're taking out their recreational vehicles, you know, their their big motorhomes and their campers and their quads and their boats. And we need to keep in mind that in many cases, especially with the motorhomes, they need to be insured. And so since we have the highest auto insurance rates in all of Canada, because ICBC is a big, bloated, government-forced monopoly with no chance to shop around, um, I wanted to take a look at how uh, drivers of motorhomes and campers uh, were paying and what rates they were paying. And so because it's seasonal and it was interesting to see so many vehicles on the road. So I took an example of, say, your average year 2000 Class C motorhome. That's the size of the ones that you'll often see for rent that are driving around on our highway. And it's, you know, not brand new, 18 years old, worth about $10,000. If you took that motorhome and you took your driver who maybe lived in Burnaby, and you insured that motorhome, under ICBC's forced monopoly, it would cost $1,400. If you took a very similar driver, without even as clean a driving record, you know, say there's still a decent driver, but the exact same vehicle, worth the same amount of money, in Calgary, they'd pay $400 to insure that vehicle. It's a $1,000 more expensive in British Columbia to insure your motorhome to drive around and enjoy this summer than it is in Alberta. And the reason for that is because the driver in Alberta can shop around. Uh, he or she can take their driving record, they can price compare, they can price match, they can get a company to beat the other one's offer, they can actually shop around based on their own experience, as we do with shopping with everything else, and get the best rate for themselves or for their families. Here in British Columbia, nothing. You've got no choice. If you want to drive a vehicle in this province, you must deal with ICBC, and that is it. And so that's why we uh, launched our website uh, this past week. It's icbcchoice.ca, and that's simply where we're encouraging people to write a letter to Premier John Horgan, to the leader of the opposition, to the leader of the Green Party, to their MLAs, saying that they want choice for auto insurance. And so that way, if you want to pick ICBC and stick with it, that's fine. Just turn it into a co-op so that it's owned by the drivers who choose it, like a credit union, very similar to that. And then next to that, open it up for competition. So those of us who don't want to deal with ICBC anymore and want to take our driving record on the road, so to speak, and shop it around and get a lower rate can do so. But right now we have no choice, and that's fundamentally unfair. And I think the example of a motorhome is a perfect example. You have the pretty much the same driver, the exact same vehicle, the same level of coverage. On the opposite side of the Rockies, $400. Over here, $1,400. That is fundamentally unfair. What's an ICBC created to uh, give people affordable car insurance? Yes, so back in the 1970s when this thing was born, which is what we try to point out was born in the era of the Gremlin and the Pinto, and we need an update. Gunsmoke was frankly the most popular TV show, and we need an update. So it was created way back when things were different in the insurance industry, and they wanted to bring some form of stability to it and lower insurance rates. Now we are generations ahead, and the auto insurance uh, system and business has changed dramatically. So much so that now, basically, the rest of Canada has passed us by here in B.C. We've been stuck with this 1970s corp, this government monopoly, since it was started uh, by the Barrett government. And now the rest of Canada almost always has a choice in auto insurance. And so they can shop around and we can't. You can shop around for auto insurance in Alberta and Nova Scotia, and we can't. And in fact, I was just speaking with a small business owner in Langley a few days ago, who had moved here this last year from Montreal, and he couldn't believe the cost. He was pulling his hair out. He said that back when he lived in Montreal, he had a daily driver. You know, it was insured for every day going to work. He paid a little over $40 a month for his auto insurance. Like, that rate is just, you know, a pipe dream for people in British Columbia. They couldn't believe it. But it's true. Quebec actually has the lowest cost of auto insurance in all of Canada. And he came out here 
great driving record, same person, same vehicle, and he's paying through the nose. And that is because if you ever have a monopoly, <laughs> you're never going to have competitive prices and you're not going to have innovation and good service. It's just common sense. Also, too, uh, with the people who have the motorhomes in B.C., you have the privilege of paying the highest gasoline prices in the country on top of having the highest insurance for it. Yes, exactly. It adds insult to injury. So you've got the highest gas prices in all of North America, especially in the Metro Vancouver area. And now that they're jacking up the transit tax and they'll be jacking up the carbon tax again next spring, we will then be paying the highest taxes in all of Canada on our on our vehicle fuels and on diesel and gasoline. And so you combine that with the highest auto insurance rates, I'm surprised people frankly leave their homes. You know, it's it's a tribute to the human spirit that they persevere and pack up the kids and pack up the motor home anyway and get out there and enjoy the great outdoors. But what we want is for people to stop getting screwed over by ICBC. It is fundamentally unfair that they're paying a thousand dollars more in Burnaby than they are in Calgary. And we even tried to be as fair as possible. We took a, a driver in British Columbia and made them a saint. They hadn't had an accident or a speeding infraction in 20 years, and they were paying $1,400 to insure their motor home. In Calgary, we just had a five-year good driver, like, and they were still paying $1,000 less. So, you know, if it weren't costing so much money, it would be almost laughable. And in other parts of the country, too, keep in mind, if you've got auto insurance through competition, you can not only shop around, but you can cluster and group your insurance. You can cluster and group it with things like your home insurance or your fire insurance or your content insurance, and it brings the prices down. You can cluster it with your spouse's vehicle, and it brings the price down. And so you just buy it. You, you're almost paying it in a form of a fleet insurance. Here, <laughs> you're just stuck paying for it no matter what because there's nowhere else to go. It's a cluster, all right. Uh, it sure is a cluster of something and a dumpster <laughs> fire on top of that, which is why we're begging David Eby, the minister responsible, um, to listen to us and to change ICBC into a co-op. They don't want to tow it to the scrapyard, fine, but give that Pinto an overhaul and change it into a co-op. Let people pick it if they want to. But if they don't want to, let the adults who own driver's licenses and vehicles shop around and get lower rates. It's just fundamentally unfair. We even have bumper stickers that you can order for free that would encourage people to to call their local MLA and to ask for ICBC choice. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and planned for Canada this summer. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, uh, an item that Bob Mackin brought up on my show, he said, why don't the victims of all the B.C. wildfires sue the government because they didn't use the Mars water bomber, the only firefighting aircraft that can fly at night and fight fires when nothing else can? Is that a good idea? Hmm. That's a good question. I hadn't thought about it in the context of taxpayers. Um, so just speaking personally, um, I was raised in the Fraser Canyon and on Vancouver Island. And uh, in my own experience, um, just watching the news, it always seemed to be the standard way of fighting forest fires, that it was a really neat innovation. From what I remember, it's a special plane that can fly low over water and scoop up water and then fly back up into the air and dump a whole lot of water all at one time. And so I know a lot of British Columbians, especially those who were in forest fire prone areas, developed a real affection for that vehicle and they were able to actually get fire, fire, uh, fire forest fires put out more quickly. And so again, just speaking personally, um, that was something that I was used to as a British Columbian girl. So not sure then why now in modern times and we're not using it. Is that the case? We're not using the Mars water bomber at all? Is it because 
from what I recall, the person who developed it owns the rights to it, and the government isn't paying for it. Is that the case? Well, yes. Uh, Colson uh, Aerial Tankers, or Flying Tankers, I think is the name of the company. The Martin Mars, yes, was built in the 40s, mm. you know, to supply troops and so on. But it has the unique ability, yes, to scoop up uh, 8,000 gallons of water in about 30 seconds, fly to the fire. And in B.C., we have major lakes and rivers everywhere, so it's not a shortage of water. The argument is it's old. Well, it's not old when you look at the interior. It has what they call a glass cockpit. It uses virtual reality hmm. to uh, and GPS. So when other airplanes are grounded because of heavy smoke or at night, it can fly and put out four acres of fire at a time. Now, nothing else in the world can do that. It's, it is unique, and its specialty is initial attack. In other words, you spot a forest fire, and it could knock it down before it becomes a serious matter. Uh, Vancouver Island, for decades, had no serious forest fires mm-hmm. because it had access to the Martin Mars. At the uh, BC municip- the Union of BC Municipalities meeting, mayors asked for the right to call in the Mars if they felt their communities were threatened by fire, and the provincial government said, no, you can't. And so, why did they say no? Was it because of cost or licensing rights? Or? They, they, they don't have a good reason. <laughs> and uh, what I'm hearing, it's a very political reason why they won't do it. And uh, it may even uh, smack of corruption. So we are... Uh, taking a closer look at that in the Goddard report, and we'll try to file further stories on it. But right now we're just getting stonewalled and we get laughed at when we asked, why are you not using this unique piece of firefighting equipment that frankly doesn't exist anywhere else in the world? When the Martin Mars was contracted out to Mexico for three months to fight their forest fires, it came home after a month because it had put them all out. Amazing. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in any situation, frankly, um, regardless if it's taxes or regulations or laws, if people stand up and be heard and speak out, and like I mean it, pick up your phone if you feel strongly about this, any of your listeners feel strongly about this, and it's something they want to see at least explored, um, and, and reconsidered, pick up your phone, phone your MLA, write a handwritten letter and write an email. And then after that, write your letter of the, your, your letter to the editor of your local newspaper and phone your local radio station. And you will be heard. There's a, there's a rule, as you know, of course, in talk radio where the idea is that for every caller you get in for a call-in show that speaks up about something and sounds off, around 100 other people care. So that's a general rule of thumb. Well, I can tell you that same thinking applies in political offices. So for every phone call that you make into the constituency office and to the capital office, in Breezy's case, obviously, it would be into Victoria, the staffer there usually thinks, if this caller called me and cares, roughly 100 other constituents, also known as voters, care about this. And so no matter what issue it is, I just encourage everybody, just be active. Like if it's about the Mars bomber, if it's about Kinder Morgan, if it's about ICBC, any of these things, like it really, really matters if you have your voice heard. And that is what moves politicians because, frankly, if they think that they're not going to get your vote, they're worried that their salary is going to be cut because they're not going to win the next election. That's what really pushes them. Uh, Also, uh, firefighters are under a gag order not to comment on the Martin Mars water bomber, I believe. Hmm. Uh, I saw the... The Martin Mars in action on the Burns Bog fire several years ago. It was estimated it would take three months to put out the deep burning fire underground. I think the Mars had it under control in three days. And I saw the firefighters cheer when it first showed up. Mm. Well, now they're not allowed to talk about it or they'll lose their jobs. That sounds so... See, this is the first I've heard about that element of it. That sounds super weird. I can just say that as a kid growing up on Vancouver Island, uh, you're right. We, you know, it was like a revered piece of flying equipment. It, w- it was uh, maybe second only to the Avro Aero for, for, for reverence. And so it surprises me that there's this complicated of a situation around it. I didn't realize that. Uh, th- there's a major propaganda, prop, uh, against, propaganda campaign against using it. I don't know why, hmm. but uh, we are trying to dig into it. I know uh, Wayne Colson, the owner of the bomber, said it costs $120,000 an hour to operate. But he said only in Canada do they look at that. Every other country looks at how many liters or gallons of water per hour you can put on a fire and what it costs. 
And he said, when you break it down that way, it's actually the cheapest firefighting airplane in Canada. Because you want to be efficient, like you want to get you want to get the job done, and so yeah, it's like they don't want the fires to be put out. It's like an industry. So strange, and so you know we we are the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, but we realize that sometimes money does need to be spent for preventative measures. For example, there was the recent uh, report. I don't know if you saw it, where uh, Canadian taxpayers are paying for things like condoms and uh, preventative measures for STDs for inmates for prisoners. And so it's, you know, several thousand dollars per year. But the alternative is to not pay for it. And then what? You have sexually transmitted diseases, things like HIV, Hep C, et cetera, being spread within uh, federal institutions like prisons. That's not a wise thing to do. And so it's always better to be preventative in order to save money, frankly, down the road. And I don't know if it's the case with this particular plane um but just again speaking personally it was always seen as a, a hero um when i was a kid in vancouver island so i'm surprised there's such a complicated factor around it now well we had a record forest fire season last year the plane was never used hmm. and bc taxpayers paid a record amount of money and they even offered the mars water bomber for free to demonstrate its ability to fight fire at night and the government said no Huh, that is just bizarre. And then we only need to remember Fort Mac as well. I'm not sure what equipment was used there to put it out. The Alberta government didn't ask for the Martin Mars either. They said there wasn't any suitable water source nearby for the plane. Uh, there's Lake Athabasca. There's, uh, you know, the lesser Great Lakes uh, near uh, Fort McMurray. I'm sure at some stretch of the river around there they could have found a, a deep enough, straight enough stretch of water. It's got a range of over 3,000 miles. So I'm sure within that they could have found water for it. There, There is some kind of national conspiracy not to use this airplane that's perfectly capable. And even though it was built in the 40s because it lands on water, mm. there's very little stress on the airframe. And it's landings and takeoffs that age aircraft the most. Also, if it had a long-term contract, they could put more powerful turboprop engines on it and it could fly faster and carry more. So why isn't this airplane being used? It should be a national treasure. Instead, right now, it's a national embarrassment. That is so strange. What an interesting story. I hope you guys actually get answers on it. Well, uh, so far, they haven't returned the phone calls. <laughs> well, good luck. Keep emailing them. And I mean that. For investigative reporters, for budding journalists, if you're listening from a journalism school, or if you're just a voter and a citizen, just keep hammering these people because they are elected to represent you, and it is their job, frankly, to answer you. And so it is fundamental. It's a big element of our democracy. It can't be overstated. So it doesn't matter, like, if it's this issue or any other major issue that is within reason, just keep after them because they need to answer you. And, frankly, as you get closer to an election, you'll be much more likely to get an answer. Chris, thank you so much for chatting with us. Is there a website people can go to to find out more about the Taxpayers Federation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can go to our main website, uh, taxpayer.com. That's where you can find out. We've got actual templates and tips on how to write letters to the editor, how to contact your elected representative, including a whole whack of email addresses and phone numbers available. And if you care about the ICBC issue and you'd like to order a free bumper sticker, it's ICBC Choice. Oh, and, and just before we go, Chris, is the Taxpayers Federation a political organization funded by political parties or from a, a certain political angle? No, we are absolutely nonpartisan. In fact, uh, our staff are not allowed to even have a membership in a political party. We are funded by grassroots activism from donations from everything from you know, little old ladies running their families to small businesses. We've been around for almost 30 years. And in fact, we aren't even a charity. So that means that if you make a donation to us, we really appreciate it, but you don't get a charitable donation receipt because that would incur cost to the taxpayer. So we are that careful about it. We are a not-for-profit advocacy organization that is nonpartisan. Anybody is able to sign up to get information and anybody can support us. Chris, thanks again. Thank you so much. You take care. My guest has been Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, their website, taxpayer.com. 
You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. If you have any questions for the show or our guests like Chris, you can send them to info at HowStream.com. Comments talk. made on the Goddard I'm Report Goddard. and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.